My name is Tim. I'm one of the elders here at North Geelong, and I'll be leading the service this morning. Um, I was also asked to sing, but for your benefit, I politely declined. So I hope um, that sits well. Um, there's a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first one is our pastor, Darren Middleton, is still on his holidays, enjoying those hopefully. Uh, he will be back Tuesday week, so not this coming Tuesday, the following one. Please don't all contact him on the same day. Just give him a little bit of time to ease back into it. Uh, we, pray, we continue to pray for Darren that he um, doesn't get too many more injuries. I've seen a few uh, pop up on Facebook. Uh, just please be safe, Darren. We do want you back. Uh, Paul Ridgewell, our brother Paul, will be preaching this morning. So we look forward to that, Paul. Uh, pleased to have you here serving us this way. Um, it's also Renew Group Study Week this week. We don't know what's happening with the lockdown yet, whether it'll be extended. Uh, for those who have got groups meeting before Tuesday at midnight, please contact your leader or they will be in contact with you. Otherwise, hopefully all your leaders will get in touch once we know what's going on. Well, those are the announcements. Um, I welcome everyone. I trust that you are all there um, in your own homes, nice and cosy. Uh, you've had your breakfast or are having it, you've got a cuppa, uh, the kids are settled, um, you're able to sit down and um, worship the Lord together with us. Uh, it's great to be here, despite the lockdown, uh, the hardships that have been going on. We're thankful for the technology that allows us to be here uh, to keep the service running. Uh, this morning, the call to worship is from Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Um, in Hebrews 4, um, the writer talks about this rest for God's people that is still to come. Um, it talks also about a great high priest who has gone before us. Uh, he knows our sin. He knows our weaknesses. Um, yet, when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he secured that rest for us through faith. So, let me read. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has, tempted, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in this time of need. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful that we can continue to meet. Um, there's a few of us here this morning, but I'm pretty sure that there are many in their own homes this morning. And that through uh, this technology, we are thankful that we are still able to worship together in spirit and in unity despite uh, the physical barriers, um, not being able to meet in person. We are thankful, Father. Uh, the burdens of lockdown is hard. Uh, the uncertainty uh, for those who are living alone, it can be hard. But uh, we are all one through your Spirit. We pray this morning that you will stir our hearts with your word, as Paul preaches, that you will renew our thoughts that they may be Christ-like. Uh, forgive us of our sin. Focus our worship. Uh, help us to block out the distractions of the week that has been, of uh, the turmoil this morning, of doing church from home. We pray that we may be focused. We may focus on Christ our Lord. We pray our worship may be pleasing to you. Strengthen us, Father, with your spirit as we worship together, Christ the King, and we give glory to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us now sing our first song, Before the Throne of God. Great. 
great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied. To look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace, one with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Well, I am back again. It is time for the children's talk. Now, you might have to help me out here because it was a bit short notice. Um, I just got to check that I've got everything. So I'm sure you kids are out there and you're watching. You might need to help me. So I'm a dad, so that's a good start. I've got my microphone, I think. Yep, you can hear me. Are you nodding your head? Yep. Okay. Okay. What else do I need for Kids Cat? I have a laminated copy of the North Geelong Catechism. That's awesome. Um, I need that so I know what questions we need to ask. Um, I was unsure about the question for this week though. Does anyone remember the last week's one? I just pulled this out of my pocket. It's a fine for $600 and keys please. I think I got in trouble last week. Um, I think there's a few others too, Mrs. Duncanson and Mr. Duncanson. Uh, we had the police uh, issue fines. So I think that was something to do with the covenant of works maybe um, and a consequence when we break the law. Uh, um, what else have I got? I've got props. You need props. This is Teddy. Um, he is the same age as me. He was given to me when I was born by my father. So I've got him and I've got this one here. I don't know his name, so I'll just call him Bluey. Um, I've got some seats down here, but they're a little bit empty. Maybe I'm missing something. I think, are we missing something? Yep. It's awfully quiet in here. So we're definitely missing the children which um, maybe I'll put Teddy and Bluey down in the seats so they can help me out. There we go. Okay, Teddy and Bluey are down in the seats and we are good to go with catechism. Okay, children, can you count to three? One, two, three for the little children because I'm going to ask three review questions and every time you get a question right, you need to put up a finger so or a thumb. So... One, two, and three. So let's turn to the start. So this is for like the really little kids, maybe under four or five, um, which is probably most of them. Um, let's ask a question. So this is really, really easy. Who made you? 
God made me. If that is what you said, without your parents' help, then um, you've got one. Right. So let's turn the page and do one from the second page. Uh, where is God? God is everywhere. That's two. Okay. How about we turn to the third page and go for a question? Uh, this is probably a bit harder. So if you've got older kids at home, they might be able to help the younger kids. What is a covenant? Good work, Brandon. Uh, a covenant is an agreement between two or more people. If you got all three, then well done. So one, two, three. You know what? If I was in New Zealand, I would say tahi rua toru, which is one, two, three in the native language. If I was in the Sabiots household, I would probably say o, do, toa. <laughs> Seb's probably shaking his head right now. Um, yeah, so he'll have to correct me on that next time he sees me. But um, yeah, let's get on to this week's question, which is, very important, did Adam keep the covenant of works? Did he? I'm asking you guys at home to help me out um, because I've actually got the answer sitting in front of me. So I already know it, but I'm hoping that you know it. So did Adam keep the covenant of works? Well, we know that a covenant is agreement between two or more people, that Adam was bound to obey it perfectly. God promised life if he obeyed, but he threatened death if he disobeyed. So it's very serious. And the Bible tells us that Adam did not keep it. He sinned against God. Um, he did not die, but he died a spiritual death. He was separated from God. And this is very serious, uh, a very serious condition of sin and death which is rain from Adam. But the good news is, children, that we have our second Adam that comes along, who came along. And he was like the first Adam. He was a type. Um, and he rescued us all um, if we have faith in him. So thank you for tuning in. Teddy and Bluey are... Uh, not paint that they're asleep. So I'll have to do better next time. But I hope that you're not asleep at home and I will work on my counting in French. So uh, let's now stand here. Oh, thanks, Matt. I'll pray for all of you who are at home. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for our children. We thank you for the blessing that they are, not only to us as parents, but the entire congregation. Uh, we thank you for the responsibility that we have uh, of raising these children, of loving them, of discipling them in your word, of pointing them to Jesus. We pray that we may continue to do this well. Father, we live in this fallen world where we are marred by sin and we are entirely corrupted by it. We're sinful by nature. Father, please help our children to see this. We pray for them that you'll work in their hearts, that you will turn their hearts from a young age, that they may trust and love Jesus. We thank you for this. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us uh, now sing the blind man. So I hope that you are doing the actions at home, children.
he cried, he cried. Okay, uh, now time for our first reading, and I hope it comes up on the projector, because I, there it is. Okay, we're good to go. Uh, Revelation 21, uh, verses 1 to 8. Uh, this is the word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 35 to the end of the chapter. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other kind of grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind of for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory." So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If it is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. 
But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. And then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As for the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as for the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed." For this perishable body shall put on the imperishable, and the mortal body shall put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is God's word, and to him to be all the praise and thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. It's my privilege today to... Uh, to Preach the Word of God, and what an, a great honor that is at any time, especially here today in my home church at my home family of God at North Geelong. So as we come to the Word, let's pray and ask God to direct our thoughts. Father, we are so mindful that we need to hear from you. Because, Lord, in the midst of the clamor and the many voices that surround us, we need to hear for the voice of God, the word of God, for we do not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from your mouth. So, Lord, help us today, we pray, as we ponder your word and think about things eternal. May your spirit bless it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of you would be familiar with these words. Words which have been spoken millions of times, perhaps billions of times. These are the words. For as much as it pleased Almighty God to take to himself the soul of our brother or sister departed, we here commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, to await the general resurrection at the last day day. Now, of course, they are the words of the service of committal for a Christian funeral. And if you haven't been to a funeral, perhaps as a young person, it will come to you. Perhaps you've seen it in a movie where you have a gathering around a graveside and the minister will pronounce these words and then people will scatter. These words speak to us of the absolute Sovereignty of God. It pleased God to take to himself the soul of someone departed. These words speak to us of the awful reality of death. A person being placed in the ground, dust to dust. It speaks to us of the ongoing existence of, the, of our human soul and our ultimate resurrection at the last day. Now, sometimes words like these are used. And I want you to listen very carefully and to want to notice the difference from the first thing that I said. Hear well. For as much as it pleased Almighty God to take to himself the soul of our brother departed, we here commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who shall change our mortal body that it may be like his glorious body, according to his mighty power whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. Did you notice the difference in the words? 
The first words are for a Christian funeral. The second words are for the funeral of a Christian. There is a big difference. The subject of death and the afterlife has become almost taboo in our society. And people write about it and say, it's the last thing we talk about. It's often said that the Victorians refused to speak about sex. Well, we live in the age where we do not want to talk about death or the world to come. Or we tend to perhaps to gloss it over and speak gently about it. We use words like pass away or passed on, or perhaps even more crude expressions like dropped off the twig or kick the bucket or pushing up daisies or cashed in the chips or worm food or the, the great Aussie one, which you probably have heard, oh, Bill Smith, he just carked it. And sometimes we hide behind humour, such as the famous words of Woody Allen who said, I'm not scared to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Now, this is a massive subject, a massive subject, which would be a series of sermons over a long period of time and a lot of Bible study. Our focus today will not be on death as such or on the reality of the fact that believers go to be with Jesus when they die. They are absent from the body and present with the Lord. But our focus will be on the Resurrection of believers at the last day, when Jesus returns in great power and in great glory. The title for our sermon today, I, I borrowed from Dr. Michael Bird from Ridley College, is Life After, Life After Death. Life After, Life After Death. And not surprisingly, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. The preacher uh, last week reminded us of the centrality of the resurrection in our Christian faith. The centrality of the resurrection in the apostolic gospel. This is what the apostles proclaimed. They are witnesses of the resurrection. And here in this great chapter, in the first few verses, Paul recites and summarizes the content of the gospel that he received from the Lord and which he proclaimed. I delivered of you our first importance, but I also received Christ, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And Paul goes on to speak about those who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, including himself. Then he goes on to address the issue of some who are at Corinth who are denying the resurrection. That is the, the great resurrection at the last day, the resurrection of all people. And Paul basically says, well, if the dead are not raised and raised in the end, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ been raised, we are still in our sins. Our life is futile. We may as well just go and get drunk and eat whatever we like every day. Either that, of course, the other option is to lapse into despair and uh, Really, there are only three options. If we're going to be really tightly logical, we either, we either live in despair, we live in hedonism, or we trust in the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. I, I can't think of any other really tight logical alternatives, but I'm not a great philosopher. But we don't want to focus so much on the consequences of denying the resurrection today. We want to focus on the great reality that Paul explains and defends here of the resurrection of our human flesh <coughs> at the end of the age. And uh, I have a few headings. First of all, I want us to think about the fact of the resurrection. The fact of the resurrection. Let us look at verses 20 to 23 here. Verses 20 to 23. Paul says, for in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first to be raised from the dead and to stay alive. He has conquered sin and death. He did so in the center of history. Then he says in verse 21, for as for 
By a man came death, and by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so all in Christ shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. And I'm just going to pause here for a minute. Tim, would you do something really kindly for me and get me a drink of water? It's under the pulpit. Ah, oh, and it hasn't been spat in, I assume. Now, we can only echo with joy the ringing certainty that what God will do in the future, that Jesus Christ will return personally, visibly, powerfully and triumphantly. The dead will be raised and those that are living at that time will be changed. Christians have always lived in the last days. But there will be a last day of the last days. Christians have always lived in the end times, but there will be an end of the end times. Jesus said, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise it up on, notice, the last day. John chapter 6. And again, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. We stake our present lives and our future destinies on the promise of God, on the great I wills of our God and of our Saviour. And in this case, that we have the promise of the eternal Word, the, the Word made flesh, the great shepherd of our souls, the bread of life, that He will raise us up on the last day if we trust in Him, if we have run to Him and cast ourselves upon Him. I wonder, do you tell yourself often, do you tell Jesus often that you believe him when he tells you that he will raise you up at the last day? Is that part of your devotional practice? Do you thank him that he will raise up your either lifeless body, bringing you together from the dust of the earth and bringing you into his presence with great glory? Or if you happen to be alive at the time when he comes back, that he will instantly change you morally and spiritually and physically and make you fit to stand before him and live in his eternal presence. Again, I quote from Jesus, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And notice the words again, I will raise him up on the last day. Truly, brethren, the best is yet to come. The resurrection of the dead is a fact. It's in God's timetable and it's rooted in His great and mighty work. The best is truly to come. This is our hope. The story goes of a lady called Merrill who uh, reflected on her childhood experience. Meryl, when she was a young person, used to go with her grandmother to church. And after church, they would always have a lovely supper. But her grandmother used to always say to her, Meryl, hold on to your fork because the best desserts are coming later. Now, during her journey in life, Meryl came to know Christ and she came to the time of her funeral and these were the days when there were, was an open casket and people walked past the open casket and they, they looked in and they saw Meryl and she was holding a fork. And they would say to the, to the vicar, Vicar, why is Meryl holding a fork? And, and the vicar would tell them the story and uh, remind them that when... Meryl came to give the arrangements for a funeral. She said, I want a fork in my coffin. And the picture as a symbol, the best is yet to 
come. And that is true of us. And I trust that today you have that strong hope written in your heart by, by the promise of God, by the completion and fullness of the satisfaction of Jesus and through a living faith. The resurrection is a fact. It's a reality. It's part of our great hope. But for, secondly, I want us to notice the method of the resurrection. The method of the resurrection. At the last day, all human beings who have ever lived will be raised up. God's people will be raised up at the same time and be given a glorious body like unto the body of our Lord and Saviour. But the question comes, how will that happen? Most certainly it will happen by the sovereign, majestic, recreative power of God. The power by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. His power, which is also perfectly informed by his deep personal knowledge of his dear, precious saints. He knows all his children. Not just that he has knowledge about them. He knows them. He's entered into their life and experience. He knows all about them and he's happy to know them. And that is how he is related to them in their Christian life. And that knowledge of them continues even after they die. Such that while each saint is their individual them, but at the same time, they are changed and fitted for life in his kingdom. The mighty power of God combined with his perfect knowledge, such that we shall be raised up to be fully who we really are. And therefore, of course, and I think it's plain from scripture that we should recognize each other in glory. At Westminster Abbey, there is, a, we might call a monument, where there is buried a soldier whose name and rank is unknown, who was brought back uh, from Europe after World War I. And there is a list of texts around where he is laid. One text says, known unto God are his children, from the book of Timothy. And another text says, and I will raise them up at the last day. Therefore, we have this, this perfect combination. This man who was unknown to human beings, but known to God. This person who will be raised up at the last day. The power of God. Now when we ponder our Lord Jesus Christ in his coming in human flesh, suffering and dying in our place, what aspect of the character of God comes into sharp and clear focus? I want you to ponder that for a minute. When we think about the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, what aspect of God's character comes into sharp and clear focus? Well, of course, it's his love. God's self-commitment and giving of himself to meet our needs, even at great personal cost. The Apostle John writes, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be an atonement for our sins. And we all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. But when we ponder our Lord's resurrection and ours, it's his sovereign recreative power that comes into sharp and clear focus. And we'll see that in a moment as we go back and look at some things about the resurrection in Paul's letter to Ephesus. It's God's power that is on display. But this power is not exercised apart from 
one other great spiritual reality. The resurrection is not some kind of random event. God has a, an order about the way he does things which reflects his great ordered mind and he made us rational creatures so that we can see his mind and worship him and love him and serve him. Now, what is that method? The means, the power of God, what is the method? Of course, that method is union with Christ. It's being in Christ. And people who know me well uh, perhaps think that I'm obsessed by union with Christ. Now, let me say this in response, brethren. I'm working on it. I really am working on it. And I hope you do as well. This is the central reality of our salvation. That we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And we see that here, here in this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verses 21 and 23. We looked at them before and notice it. For as by a man, referring to Adam, came death, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, in union with Adam, in connection with Adam, everybody dies. So also in Christ, in connection with Christ, in legal headship with Christ, all shall be made alive. Thomas Goodwin was an old Puritan theologian and he he used this illustration that said that before God there are two great giants. There's giant Adam and reverently giant Jesus and all human beings hang from the belt of either. In Adam, because of his headship, because of his sin, all die. That is the legal sentence by the just judge. A sentence you cannot bargain away. A sentence you cannot cheat. God gets all people in the end. You might have heard of a man called Robert Alton Harris, who was uh, put to death by lethal injection in 1992. And he went through a long saga of actually getting strapped down and then released. And finally the time came for him to die. And the head of the prison said, you know, what are your final words that you want passed on after you die? And he, he passed them on to Mr. Prowse. And uh, these words have come into folklore since. And uh, I can imagine death metal rockers banging their head against walls singing these words. You may have heard of them. You may be a king or a street sweeper, but everybody dances with the grim reaper. Human beings can do many things wonderful things, many amazing things, but we will never beat death. Never. But the good news is there is one who never sinned, always obeyed, always trusted God, and in fact trusted God so perfectly that he died on the cross to take away our death sentence, rose triumphant and now reigns as Lord of all and as Christian as someone who has swapped giants. Or more accurately, God has swapped the giants for you. We, instead of being in union with Adam and headed to death physically and death eternally, are now those who belong to Christ, who have been made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and at his coming, those who, notice, belong to Christ, who are in union with Christ. I want us to just quickly look at some verses in the book of Ephesians. So if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, if you have your Bible open there, and we see the significance of the resurrection, both in terms of Christ himself and uh, then us, because... Christianity is a story, a message of three resurrections. And unless you have the second one, you'll never get the third one. Not in a happy sense, anyway. 
In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul eulogizes God in his great sovereign saving work, going from election in the past and uh, redemption through the blood and then the sealing of the Spirit. And then he prays. And uh, one great focus of his prayer, if you look at uh, verse 19, he says, and Sorry, go back to the verse 18. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority. Paul says in this, as he's praying, I want you to know how powerful God is. And in fact, I want you to know that you are the personal object of the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That is what made you a Christian. You might think, and that's right, that you said a prayer or whatever you did, and that's all okay. But behind that and underneath that is a mighty work of spiritual resurrection. The power of God raised the lifeless body of Jesus from the grave and seated him at the highest place in the universe on God's throne. But then if we go to chapter 2, and remember there's no chapter breaks in the original. And Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's playing here on the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection and then our death and resurrection. And he goes on to explain what spiritual death looks like. And it's being in bondage to the powers of the air. It's living in our own passions. It's being under the wrath of God. But then he says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, that he loved us, even when we were dead, reminder, reminder, in our trespasses, what did he do? What did he do? He made us alive. There's the second resurrection. He made us alive with Christ, and he raised us up with Christ, and he made us sit with Christ. That is the wonder of union with Christ. The Jesus-saving story and actions become ours. When Jesus was incarnate in the womb of Mary, he, eternal deity, was joined permanently to human flesh. And when Jesus perfectly obeyed the law of God in thought and word and deed, We were in him as he did that. And when he set his face to go like Flint to Jerusalem to suffer for us, we were in him. And when he died on the cross, we were in him. When he was raised, we were in him. When he was lifted up to glory, we were in him. Jesus' saving actions become our saving actions. I like to think about it this way in terms of understanding our faith. If I say Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again, that's history and well-established history. And if I say that Jesus Christ lived for sinners and died for sinners and rose again for sinners and was raised up in glory for sinners, that's what we call theology. But when we say from our hearts, Jesus Christ lived for me and died for me and was raised again for me and I was in him, that is spiritual reality. That is living Christianity. All of them are Christianity. But without the third reality, we will not participate in the final reality. So I simply ask you, have you swapped giants? (laughs) Have you swapped giants? Have you swapped giants? And if you haven't swapped giants, I call upon you in Jesus' name, do it right now. (laughs) 
Don't wait for anything. Do it right now as you're sitting at home with your a little one, you're an adult, a parent, doesn't matter. Do it right now. Call upon Jesus. Say, Jesus, please, I want to get out of Adam and I want to belong to you. Please, save me. Bring me out of the realm of death and bring me into the realm of life. He will hear that prayer. And what you say to them, then you can claim that promise of Jesus. That if you trust in him, then you will be raised up on the last day to glory. Now just quickly, just quickly, Colossians chapter 3 and the first couple of verses, just quickly. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, If then you have been, here it is, raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above not on things of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We sang that before in the song that we sang. And then he says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Again, we have been raised with Christ. We have died with Christ. And Paul adds the extra thing. One day we will appear with Christ. Christ will be unveiled. That's the idea. He will be made Manifest, it's like drawing back the curtain on a stage. Jesus is hid behind the curtain, as it were, and the time will come when the curtain will be drawn back and we will see him for who he is. But the wonder of it is, the wonder of it is, at the same time, we will be appeared to as well. Our life now in Christ is hidden. It's hidden with him. It can't be seen. It's real. It's spiritual. It's kept for us. But one day it will become physical. So that the resurrection at the last day is union with Christ and its blessings becoming physical. This is God's method of bringing us into resurrection. Now, now, we move on to the next subject. What are the characteristics of the new body? So we've seen the fact of the resurrection, the method of the resurrection. Now we want to look at the nature of the resurrection. The nature of the resurrection. Verses 35 and following in 1 Corinthians 15. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. Or as it could be, Translated in modern parlance, you thickhead. It's not a very kind thing for a pastor to say in, to someone in church, really, is it? But it must have been true. You thickhead. Or in Australian parlance, you're as thick as two planks, mate. You should get this, but you don't. Perhaps what was happening here is the person thought that the resurrection body was an exact continuance of the present body. But Paul puts forward an argument flowing from God's amazing versatility and power and creation. And basically he is saying, do we need bodies for the environment of the air? Sure, then God created birds. Do we need bodies for the environment of the sea? Yeah, well, God created fish. Do we need bodies for the environment of the heavens? Well, God created stars and planets. Do we need bodies that will be fitted for the eternal world to live with God forever and ever and rule over his new creation? Absolutely. So that they'll have to be made new. Horses for courses, bodies for environments, and so it is with the resurrection of the body. And to quote a famous preacher, I just want to camp here for a, a little while in these couple of verses, in this great contrast that Paul gives. In verse 42 and 43. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. What is sown in weakness is raised in power. What is sown a natural body is raised a spiritual body. Brethren, dear ones, saints of God, this is your destiny. One day, God is going to give you a body that will never be liable to corruption or decay or dissolution or breaking down. An imperishable body. 
it will not wear out. A body which will be appropriate to living in our imperishable, incorruptible, decay-free, dissolution-free inheritance that Paul talks about, sorry, Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1. And you can look that up, the first few verses. Some of you are acutely aware that your present body is wearing out. You may be acutely aware that your present brain is wearing out, that it cannot do what it once used to do. Dear Saint, your resurrection body will never wear out, and God is going to give you a brain that will burn rubber. The second contrast is between dishonor and glory, or it could be translated between a lowly, pitiful state and a glorified state. Glory is revealed when misery is taken away. <laughs> That's what Paul seems to be saying. The word glory usually has the sense of weightiness, heavy, or it can have the idea of splendor, of outshining brilliance something which is in, indeed deeply impressive Jesus said we shall all shine like the sun in the kingdom of the father and Paul in Philippians talks about our lowly bodies being transformed to be like his glorious body dear brother and sister God says that one day you are going to look really impressive really Impressive. You will be an impressive physical and moral specimen. Indeed, perhaps I won't be bold and ugly in the resurrection. I don't know. The next contrast is between weakness and power. The idea of weakness implies decreasing and declining capacities that belongs with old age. And indeed, we know Physical decline begins almost from the time we are born. But the new body that God gives us will be powerful. It will be effective. It will have the full capacity to do everything forever that God wants us to do. Will it mean, as Johnny Erickson Tata imagines, and some of you may have read her book about heaven, it's worth a read, and she imagines that we will be able to instantly travel to Ursa Minor to explore the stars in a flick of a finger. Perhaps we don't know. But it's not, of course, beyond the goodness, the generosity of our God to give us, in the words of the poet, powers unfought and undreamed of. And the final climactic contrast is between natural and spiritual. We will have bodies no longer ravaged by sin and its consequences. And in this contrast, it's not between physical and non-physical. The word spiritual does not mean non-physical. It just means, and again, if you want to do the study, you can check out the way that Paul uses these two words in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15. What Paul is referring to here is someone who is guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. It's a capital S. And you have to remember that in the Greek New Testament, when the word spirit is used, it doesn't come with a capital. We have to decide in context whether it should be capitalized or whether it's the human spirit. And that, in most cases, is fairly obvious. In our translation, it's translated here, little s, but I think there's a really strong case for saying it's big S. In our resurrection bodies, in the new world, we will be totally controlled by the Holy Spirit of God because the age to come is the age of the Spirit. And that age of the Spirit has started now in our hearts and in our churches. God has destined us to have a decay-free, weighty, impressive, powerful, spirit-ruled body. These things that we've been thinking about are enshrined in our great creeds and catechisms. Now, and we're going to have up on the screen some of the great statements from the history of the church about 
this because this great reality of our resurrection from the dead and life everlasting is part of our Catholic faith and I don't mean Roman Catholic the church universal notice what it says I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting that's the Apostles Creed and we have a similar one in the Nicene Creed and I look for the resurrection of the dead a little bit different language there. It's more focused on our actions. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So that every time we say this creed, we're reminding ourselves of the personal exercise of our faith. Next one, please. Ah, the Heidelberg Catechism. For those of you that come from a, a Reformed church, European Reformed church background, you are probably raised on this. Heidelberg Catechism and Porridge. For breakfast what comfort does the resurrection of the body afford thee that not only my soul after this life shall be immediately taken up to Christ its head but also that this my body being raised by the power of Christ shall be reunited with my soul and my like unto the glorious body of Christ and then 58 in the same catechism what comfort takest thou from the article life everlasting that since now I feel on my heart the beginning of eternal joy, after this life I shall inherit perfect salvation, which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive, and that to praise and glorify God forever. And the next one. And uh, I shall not read this, but I, shall, uh, I recommend it to you. This is the larger catechism from the Westminster Standards. And, you know... This catechism was written for children of lesser abilities. Lesser abilities. And notice the length of the, of the answer. By virtue of his resurrection as their head shall be raised in power, spiritual, incorruptible, and be made to be like his glorious bodies, and the bodies of the wicked shall be raised up to dishonor by him as an offended judge and uh, last but not least oh sorry it isn't least shorter catechism what benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection at the resurrection believers being raised up to glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity and the next one thanks uh, ah and here and, and last but not least the Great Catechism, NGPC, Children's Catechism. And the last few questions, and we all went, yay, go NGP Catechism. Will the bodies of the dead be raised to life again? And it says, what? Yes! And everybody at home says, yes! There will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And the next one, thanks. What will happen to the righteous in the day of judgment? The righteous will live with Christ forever in the new heaven and new earth. And we all said, hallelujah, amen to that. Just a couple of quick applications. There are so many things and there's so many things that I haven't said. Firstly, I want us to think about the great reality of death and mortality. Young people, older people, I, I want you to stare down your mortality. And perhaps for some of you, a terrible, perhaps even hidden fear of death that you don't speak about to anybody. To stare down the reality of your mortality. You don't have to have a brush with death to stare down your mortality. You just have to believe the word of God. That as in Adam, all die. And that is a simple, plain reality. And God says to you, stare it down. Stare it down. You are mortal flesh. And it's not morbid or weird to remind ourselves and each other regularly that we're going to die. And that we're going to be raised up on the last day. These are great eternal realities. So I commend that to you. The second thing I want to say and remind us of that the absolute importance of the physical body. God is not interested in 
saving immortal souls. He saves whole people, body, soul, entities, because that's how we were created in the first place. And when God recreates us, as it were, we will have body, soul, entities, but except, of course, in the eternal state, hallelujah, it will be permanent. <laughs> it will be permanent. Because Jesus Christ himself has permanently entered into the eternal world as the head of the new creation and has carried us with him. It's permanent. And the third thing that I would remind you about again, and I'm coming back to what I said before. Which giant do you belong to this morning? Or perhaps you're not sure which giant you belong to. Well, give your soul no rest till you know that you're in Christ and that you know you're in Christ. Call out to him. Seek him. Take those verses from John chapter 6 and the, and the promises of Jesus. Take them to God. And ask the Holy Spirit to burn them into your soul so that you rejoice in the great realities of of Jesus said, and I will raise him up on the last day. Amen, brethren in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, please write your word on our hearts. Refresh us by your truth. Fill us with joy and hope in believing. And may your word encourage and embolden us to serve you faithfully, you in my small corner, you in your small corner, and I in mine. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing. Jesus' blood and righteousness, no merit of my own I claim, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Here's my toilsome race. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock. His covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When every earthly prop gives way, He then is still my strength and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. trumpet voice shall sound oh may we then in him be found wrote in his righteousness alone boldless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock
Wonderful. Let's continue uh, to respond to uh, the Word of God this morning. We've just sung uh, about the surety of Jesus uh, and the hope that we have. Uh, All else is sinking sand. Let's pray to God uh, together this morning, knowing that good truth and having a sure hope. Let's pray. Holy and awesome God, you are an amazing God who has kept his promises. We are astounded by the the plans uh, that you had in uh, time immemorial and have kept in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you, Father God, for sending your Son, for raising him to life, raising him up in glory, so that we might be saved, so that we might glorify him and see him as king, as great high priest, as Lord. We come before you, God, knowing that important truth, that he is our saviour. We come before you, God, knowing that we are robed in his righteousness alone. There is nothing we can do that can enable us to come before you with confidence. And so we pray to you with confidence now, but we pray also knowing that before you we are ashamed, we are stained by the sins of this week, of this morning, of our past. And we are sorry, God, for our sins. We are sorry, God, for our arrogance, our hubris, in thinking that we can do it alone. We can, um, we can persevere in our own strength. We are sorry, God, for our miserliness, our lack of generosity. We are sorry, God, for our lustful thoughts, our angry thoughts and words and actions. And Lord, we bring them before you now and we repent of them and we pray, Lord, that in Jesus, our, the, the stain of our sins is washed away by his blood. And we ask, Lord, that by your spirit we might live holy lives dedicated to your glory and the sharing of the gospel and the the building up of your church. And we pray, Lord, that we would continue to uh, become more like Jesus, be sanctified each and every day by your spirit, we pray this morning. And we thank you, God, for the sermon we heard this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the beginning of eternal joy that we can uh, experience in this life, in this moment, knowing that Jesus' resurrection is sure. Our resurrection, therefore, is sure. Our hope is sure. Help us to live with surety, with real trust, we pray this morning. Uh, Help us to live knowing it's the last days, Prepare us for Christ's return. Guide us by your spirit to love you well, love one another well, to share the gospel with urgency. Help our lives to be shaped by the spiritual and historical theological truths of the sermon this morning, of your word preached this morning. We thank you, Lord, for those living by those spiritual truths Uh, in other parts of this world, those that we support around the world. We think this morning uh, of the Dobbies. We think this morning of Haiti in general. And we pray, Father God, for your blessing on uh, Potter's house. We pray, Father God, for the nation of Haiti as it um, transitions from the assassination of uh, the president there, uh, Jovenel Moise. We pray, God, that it would navigate that transition well. We pray, God, that you would enable this Potter's house to, to provide a source of hope Uh, true uh, living hope uh, to those around them as they uh, do good work there. May they share the gospel uh, in a nation that is in desperate need of such hope. We think, Lord, also of our northern neighbours, Indonesia, who are are struggling in the face of of real darkness as, um, as the calamity of COVID continues to spread and cause destruction there. We pray, Lord, that the hope of the gospel would be spreading that those who are Christians there would be shored up by it, um, knowing that this is not all there is. We pray, Father God, for your comfort on the many families affected there by the pandemic. 
And we think of ourselves also, Lord, this morning as we are uh, experiencing uh, the effects of um, the pandemic, we, this uh, lockdown, as it affects much of this nation, at least in New South Wales and Victoria with lockdowns. We often don't recognise how desperate we are for true and living hope when we are surrounded by the good life. Uh, we pray, Lord, that during this lockdown that uh, as many search for solace and comfort, they might find you and be comforted by you, the true and living God. Draw them to yourself this time. We pray that especially for this city of Geelong. May the gospel be for them the good news it ought to be. May the ministries of, of North Geelong and the, and the surrounding local churches be consistently highlighting the goodness of the gospel, the greatness of Jesus and the good, sure hope it brings. We thank, Lord, of the ministries at Geelong West. We thank you for the McSevenies. We thank you for Luke and his ministry. We, we pray, God, that as they plan on going on a, on a holiday uh, together, the family, we pray, God, that you would uh, give them a great time together. Um, it would be a, a refreshing time. May they grow uh, in their trust in you and in closeness with each other as a family unit. We thank, Lord, also of the Daroons, at Bano. We thank you for Matt and his ministry and we, we thank you also for Steph and um, we know that she's due uh, tomorrow or this week. We pray God that you'd be blessing um, the birth of their child. We pray God that you'd be keeping Steph and Bub safe. We pray also for Esther that uh, you'd be doing the same as she's due uh, sort of any moment now Lord. And We pray God that you'd be blessing that, uh, keeping Esther and Bub safe and um, knowing, uh, may they know uh, your comfort and peace and, and your goodness as, um, as that happens soon. We think also of the others that are pregnant in the congregation, uh, Ailsa, Mal and any others we don't know about. We pray, Father God, that uh, you'd be blessing them uh, in their pregnancies, keeping uh, all well and we look forward to hearing of good news of the birth of children over the coming months. We pray, Father God, for those of us who might be uh, struggling at this time in the congregation, we pray, Father God, that you'd be a source of comfort and peace to them. We pray that for joy as she mourns the loss of her dear, uh, her dear pet. We pray, God, that um, she'd be able to grieve well and you'd be a good source of comfort for her. May she know your peace. We pray, Father God, that you'd be comforting those with physical or mental ailments, especially chronic ones, God. We pray, Father God, that um, although many of Many of us hide, perhaps, our pain or struggles from others. Uh, may we each rely on your strength to sustain us. Help us to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, it says in Hebrews 12. Help us to run the race well set before us. It can be difficult to rely on you and your strength. Um, we often want to carry our own weights or burdens. Help us to lay them aside, to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And we thank you, God, that Jesus went before us to the cross, taking on our sin and shame so that we can trust in him properly and fully and freed from any, any shackles or weights that, that uh, hold us back. Thanks again, Lord, for the image of the future presented from Scripture for us this morning. We look forward to Christ's return. We look forward to our resurrection, the new heavens and the new earth. We look forward to when there is no longer any pain or death or sadness, we praise you that we get small glimpses now of your grace, small glimpses of true joy uh, in this life. And, and we as a community, although separated into our households, we are a community and we look forward to the fullness of your plans coming about in Christ's return. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray together. And we pray it together in his name. Amen. Let's sing our final song together. We're going to sing... Uh, a song praising God the Son. We're going to sing a song, um, There is a Redeemer. Precious Lamb of God. 
Thank you for joining us uh, for our worship service this morning. We look forward to being in person next week, God willing. Uh, if you need to speak to one of the elders during the week, please do. Uh, Matt, myself, Daniel or Richard. Um, the benediction this week before we sing our final song is from the book of Numbers chapter 6. It is Aaron's blessing to Israel, the people of God and you are God's people. We are God's people. If we are tethered together uh, with Jesus, if we have swapped giants from Adam as our head to Jesus. Um, so be confident that this blessing is for you if indeed you are in Christ Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.